You're very welcome back to our Words of Wisdom series on Shalom World. My name is Father Mark Byrne, and I'm a priest in the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, also known as SOLT, S-O-L-T. This is a series of six programs on the topic of becoming a living Eucharist. In the first program, I told you how I came across this expression, living Eucharist, in some spiritual writings. And I sensed immediately, as if I got a little light from above, that this was a treasure. I said, what is that, to become a living Eucharist? And so for a year or two, I asked Jesus to teach me and to make it happen. And finally, Pope Francis used the expression in one of his Wednesday catechesis in St. Peter's Square. And so what we're going to do in the six programs is bring you in deeper into what Jesus wants to do in Holy Communion. That is, he wants to change you into himself. We think of receiving him in Holy Communion into ourselves. But really what he wants to do is take you into himself and change you into himself. This second program is to do with your plumbing. And uh, we're going to look and see, do you need your plumbing fixed? We say the problem might be in your plumbing because the grace of the life of the Most Holy Trinity has to flow down through the earth into souls through the sacraments and flow out to make all things new in Christ. This direction of Jesus receiving us in Holy Communion is not a new teaching. As far back as the fifth century, Pope Saint Leo the Great said this, When we celebrate the Lord's Paschal sacrifice, the leaven of our former malice is thrown out and a new creature is filled and inebriated, made drunk with the Lord himself. For the effect of our sharing in the body and blood of Christ is to change us into what we receive. We're not accommodating Jesus when we receive him in Holy Communion. He's taking us into himself. Nearly a thousand years later, in the 16th century, the co-founder of the Congregation of Clerics Regular of the Divine Providence, known as St. Cajetan, wrote to a family member, My child, you must not receive Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament simply as a means to further your own plans. I want you to surrender to him, that he may welcome you, and as your divine savior, do to you and in you whatever he wills. In the 19th century, St. Peter Julian Amard, founder of the Congregation of the Blessed Sacrament, said, When we work, we must eat well. What a joy that you can receive Holy Communion often. It's our life and support in this life. Receive Communion often and Jesus will change you into himself. That's what's behind these words, becoming a living Eucharist. And finally, our beloved St. Maria Faustina of the Most Blessed Sacrament. Most people know her as Faustina, but her full name was Sister Maria Faustina of the Blessed Sacrament. And therefore, she had a special grace to penetrate into the mystery of the Eucharist. She said this in her diary, paragraph 1826. When I had received Jesus in Holy Communion, my heart cried out, Jesus, 
Transform me into another host. I want to be a living host for you. You are great and all powerful. You can grant me this favor. And the Lord answered her, You are a living host, pleasing to the Heavenly Father. And I replied, Oh my Jesus, I understand the meaning of host. I desire to be before your divine majesty, a living host. That is, a living sacrifice that daily burns in your honor. That's what Jesus is in the Holy Communion. A living sacrifice that daily burns to the honor of the Father. And Faustina said, me too. Finally, if you go to Mass in the cycle of the liturgical year, on the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time, at the conclusion of the Mass, this is the prayer of the priest. It is the voice of the Holy Spirit in the liturgy of the Universal Church, new wine being poured out in abundance in our times and flowing to the whole world, that we may become in Christ a living Eucharist. As the people are sent forth at the end of Mass and Mission, having heard the Word of God and offered the bread of eternal life, the priest says, let us pray. Grant us, Almighty God, that we may be refreshed and nourished by the sacrament we have received, so as to be transformed into what we consume. Through Christ our Lord, amen. I'm not fitting Jesus in. I'm not changing him to fit my life. I must be transformed into what I have eaten. I mentioned at the beginning that we need to consider the question of plumbing, because life is a matter of plumbing. Not just your gut, as I uh, described in the first episode, but for example, your cardiovascular system. It's a plumbing system. And so it is with the life of grace, the life of your soul and your spirit. Think of the description of water from the temple in the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. Or Jesus offering living water to the Samaritan woman, which he says will turn into a spring of living water within her. It's plumbing. Or when you get to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, you see in St. John's description of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven in the book of the Apocalypse, that there is a river of the water of life flowing through the center of the city, the city where the saints will live for all eternity. Life is something continuous. It flows. If it stops, it stagnates. So where does the living Jesus go after we receive him in Holy Communion? Well, he continues his life, for he is eternal life. The question is, what about us? Does he take us with him? Do we follow him? Well, it depends on our disposition. Disponere is a Latin word meaning to arrange or order something, to align something. Jesus comes in the Blessed Sacrament and sees whether we're aligned to him. He sees what is inside a man, what the man has told himself in the inner conversation of his heart, what he has chosen for his life. After driving the money changers from the temple, Jesus reveals in a veiled manner about the temple of his body. It says in the second chapter of St. John, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, 
Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not trust himself to them, because he knew all men, and he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. The infinite sea of his divine life can be blocked by our disposition to preserve our own life. To this man, Jesus does not entrust himself. What does it gain a man to preserve his own life and lose eternal life? You see the opposite in St. Paul. He writes to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, and now I live not with my own life, but with the life of Christ who lives in me. Paul uses the word life four times in a sentence. We used to get in trouble in school. Teacher would say, well, you can't use the same word four times in a sentence. <laughs> That's what Paul does. I have been crucified with Christ, and now I live not with my own life, but with the life of Christ who lives in me. Paul means intentional life, not biological life. He says to Timothy to tell those who abound in the things of this earthly life to instead grab hold of eternal life. Again, he says to Timothy, if we die together with him, we shall also live together with him. For Paul, this is not some future event. It's something here and now. A continual dying and rising. Life is not something one merely has. Rather, it's a way of living. And as I make my way in this world, I can gain my life or I can lose it. I can choose life and choose to answer the invitation made to Jesus at my baptism to follow him. Where? Into his death and then pass over with him into eternal life. Paul makes the same invitation to the Colossians. He says, as you have received Christ, Eucharistic reference, probably, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. We are to walk into Christ and walk with Christ, to conduct our lives in a certain way. There are good Christians who live for God and avoid serious sin. They do good and attain salvation. But Paul talks about living in God, something very different. There are only a few souls who completely stripped of themselves are small enough to enter through the slit in his sacred heart and live in Christ. The fruit of these few little ones is immeasurably greater than that of the merely good souls who only live for God. We need those souls in our times, those who live in the heart of Christ. Jesus asks us to give him life, as Mary, his mother, gave him life. On feast days of Our Lady, one of the antiphons from morning prayer reads, Through you, Immaculate Virgin, the life we had lost was returned to us. How can this be? That Our Lady gives God's life to man that a mere creature can give God's life to the rest of humanity because she lived only of divine life. 
Her human life was fully taken up into the divine life of God. Jesus wants to continue his life on earth as in heaven. He wants to live. This is the greatest gift you can give him and to our mother Mary and to all your brothers and sisters to give life to Jesus and give to all creatures the life of Jesus. This is the greatest life we could possibly live, the greatest achievement, the true purpose for which we were created. To give life to God, who is himself eternal life and the origin of all life. A saint is able to do this. For example, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, she was asked by Jesus to bring his light into the hovels of the poor. And he said to her, unless she went, he could not go. She gave him life among the poorest of the poor. The reason Jesus gives his life to a soul in Holy Communion is so he can continue his life on earth as in heaven. And so the purpose of the sacrament of the Eucharist is that a soul may substitute for Jesus' humanity and his suffering on earth and manifest his victories over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And for that to happen depends on what Jesus finds when he communes with souls at communion time. If he's able to continue his life because they desire him to be their life and they are dead to the world, then he will continue. If not, he fades away. We enter his divine life by being crucified with him. The cross is the door to life. Through his wounds, we enter his body and then his soul and then his divinity and are made new. We prepare for us by ordering our natural life because grace builds on nature. We need to eat properly and sleep properly and get some exercise. We need friendships and laughter, art, music, handcrafts, work. This is our natural life. And we prepare our souls with this truth. Jesus is greatly attracted to those who suffer for love of him and those who mortify and empty themselves for love of him, who provide space for him to live and to repeat his life. Jesus embraces us with wounded hands. He has no other way to embrace us because he kept those wounds when he rose from the dead and they remain with him for all eternity. If we try to wriggle out of his embrace, his cross, we lose his life as well. Jesus comes down from heaven in the consecration of the mass so we may be lifted up to the things of heaven. Psalm 144 says that he raises all who are bowed down. The abasement of Jesus in the Eucharist lifts a fallen world and rescues us from slavery to receive the blessing of eternal joy. This blessing is the life of God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who live in freedom and eternal gladness. How does God communicate this to you? How does God communicate his life to you? He brings you into himself. He gives you his spirit so that you may participate in divine life. Thank you for listening. May God draw you deeper into that life.
And in the next episode, we will explore with great joy what it means to live life without measure. Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.